question a week or so ago that uh, actually came a telephone call. And the, the, the idea, the gentleman said, you know, I've been listening to commentators about what's going on in the world today and that kind of stuff. Listen to Glenn Beck and, and uh, Tucker Carlson and uh, the Peterson guy and so forth. And he said, they, you know, they're, they're talking about this and that and the next thing. And he said, my question is, in 2 Thessalonians 2, he talks about a strong delusion. What is that? Is that what's going on today? And uh, Glenn Beck is a Mormon. You're not going to get much help out of him. Carl, uh, Tucker Carlson, I don't know what he is, said he was a Catholic at one time. And Gordon, uh, Jordan Peterson is an atheist. He's a religious, friendly atheist. And uh, so the, the, all you're going to get out of them is a, bunch, is, a, is a lot of good human viewpoint. Now, human viewpoint is not always bad when it's, uh, when it's, when it's observing things. And Peterson actually has, has uh, uh, some very interesting ability to look at. He's a psychologist, look at the psychology behind things. And Glenn Beck is, is a guy who looks, at, looks through um, a lot of the conspiracy things. And Tucker Carlson is, is whatever he is. And so it isn't that these guys are bad things, but the, the, the spiritual perception that you need to understand a pastor like Second Thessalonians chapter 2 isn't going to be in those guys. And those guys aren't going to be communicating the things that are talked about here. So I thought I would just discuss that just a little bit with you um, because my habit in, in politics and, and, and social things is to listen to people I disagree with. <laughs> You, you, there's a confirmation bias when you listen to people you agree with all the time. They're just talking about the same thing and you're confirming, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you never expand your thinking process. You never challenge anything you think. You'll never find any errors in what you think because you're always just growing to everybody. So I, my habit has always been to kind of, you know, listen to some of these, but listen to people that I disagree with so that I can, well, one, keep your blood circulating, and two, you can kind of challenge the things that you're thinking about and challenge what they say. The problem with that today is that the people on the other side are so vacuous. I mean, when, when Whoopi and the other gal is, is your, your, they're your intellectual giants for the, you know, for the, for your, your, your philosophy, you don't have much going for you. And journalists today are really just, uh, you know, political activists. And so you don't really have much of that. But in my generation, uh, you know, if you said what was uh, your generation's most well-known uh, journalist, it would be Carl uh, Bernstein. And he's the guy that did the, the Watergate stuff. But when you find out about guys like that, he was a former naval intelligence officer that worked for Richard Nixon. And he went to work for the newspaper. And as a, as a rookie cub news reporter gets the gets a sign, which that's not something that normally happens, a sign to a, a thing. With, his deep throat was, an F, was the second guy at the FBI. The people that did the Watergate break-in were all CIA, all except one was CIA. So you got a naval intelligence officer second guy in the FBI and the CIA taking down the president. And you go, nobody noticed that until now. So when I think about all this stuff, we, we got to, I think it's what this verse is talking about, <laughs> but it's not. But anyway, it's the same kind of thing. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 11. What, what, what is this strong delusion? Verse number uh, Second Thessalonians 2, verse 11. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. So the first thing you want to do when you look at that is kind of notice when he says, for this cause God shall send them. The timing is future, not past. So this is something going to happen in the future from where Paul is. If you go back to verse number um, 6, now you know what withholdeth, that he might be, be, be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. That word let there is the idea of withholding. That, you, you see that in verse, verse 6. You, um, you know what withholdeth, and then it's going to let. Letting in the sense, of, I, I said to you this morning, you let, you let a, a bucket down in a well, you let it go, you let your child out. You're, with a, with, a, with a, uh, a rope, you're holding them back as well as letting them go. Uh, the words used in, in, if you play tennis, uh, which I don't play, but if you did, 
when a, a ball goes over the net and it hits the net on the serve, the, the, the word that they call, I used to think that it was, they would say net, but it's not net, it's let. That is, the ball is hindered from, in the serve. So that word let is, is a word even in, in our modern day is used that way. Most of the time we, we just use it. But the, the withholding part of it is really it. And he who now letteth will let. And you notice in verse number 6 it says, Now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work only he who now letteth. So it's a what and a he. The what is a dispensation of grace. The he is the body of Christ. So you understand that there's something that's holding back the working of the man of sin. It's, 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 it's restraining him. And what it is, is, is the church, the body of Christ. There's, a, there's, a, there's an order in prophecy. Come back, come back with me to Acts chapter 2. There's an order in the prophetic program, a time, a time element and an order in which these things are, are, are to be uh, executed. On the day of Pentecost, now Jesus had talked about it with these, with these guys. If you go back to uh, Mark chapter 13, for example, when Christ in his earthly ministry, just, just two days before he's crucified, he takes them up on the Mount of Olives and he talks to them about, about the future. And he tells them, Mark 13, uh, try, try to verse, uh, verse 13, 13, 13. Ye shall, ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure unto the end the same shall be saved. Now the end there is going to be the end, the end of the tribulation. But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing, uh, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand, then let him that is in, in Judea flee to the mountains. So there's, there's the Antichrist going to be manifest, sit in the temple, and then, then, then they, they flee. Verse number 19, but in those days shall... Oh, in those days shall be affliction, such as was not, from the beginning of the creation, which God created unto this time, neither shall be. And except the, that the Lord hath shortened those days, no flesh shall be saved. But for the elect's sake, uh, they, they, uh, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened those days. So in the, in the tribulation, the seventh week of Daniel, the Antichrist is set up. They, they know there's a schedule coming. Verse number 30, if you go down there, it says, Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things come. So the people he's talking to are expecting these events to take place. Now, you know, if you put the chart up, you have the earthly ministry of Christ, the book of Acts, you're starting in the prophetic program. And when you come to Acts chapter 2, the people he just told that to, Peter says this, the Holy Spirit comes on in verse 14, and he begins to speak as the Spirit gives him utterance. Verse 15, he says, verse 16, he says, This is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. So what's happening on the day of Pentecost is the fulfillment of Joel chapter 2. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith the Lord, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters and shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your servants and on my, my hands made, I will, handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood, fire, and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon in, into blood, before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So Peter sent two things prophesied in Joel. Number one, the Spirit's going to be poured out, and what's happening right now is that. The next thing is he's going to pour out his wrath. So what they're doing, when you, when you come in the book of Acts, the Spirit's being poured out, and the next thing coming is the wrath of God. And the wrath of God inter, inter, uh, goes into the, the 70th week and so forth with the Antichrist. So when you come across the book of Acts and you start in the book of Acts, you're seeing prophecy being fulfilled, but it didn't happen. The Spirit came, but the wrath didn't come. Now, why didn't it come? Well, you go to Romans chapter 11. Paul explains to you that what's going on, Romans chapter 11, verse 11, now if the fall of them, talking about Israel, be the riches of the, of, of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. So God has interrupted the prophetic program with the fall of Israel. And when he did that, verse 13, he makes Paul the apostle of the Gentiles, and he reveals to the apostle Paul, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God that's given to me, to you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, 
which was kept secret in time past, but now is made manifest, that I'm reading Ephesians, I'm quoting Ephesians 3. I look at you, you probably ought to read it. Verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs in the same body and partakers as promised in Christ by the gospel. In other words, God's interrupted prophecy with a secret program that he didn't tell anybody about. Now, you know the verses, Acts 3, Peter says, this is that which is spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. That's what's going on in, in early Acts. Paul said, I'm preaching Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. So God interrupts prophecy. And that interruption stops the, the movement of prophecy, stops it right there. Now you have the dispensation of grace. Now, if you look back at 2 Thessalonians 2, and you notice in verse number 7, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. It's already started. It's working in the dispensation of grace. It doesn't come to a com completion until after the dispensation of grace. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. So this thing starts, but it doesn't, it, 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 it's interrupted, and it's going to be interrupted until the dispensation of grace is over with. The body of Christ is taken out of the way. Now, if you look down at verse 13, you'll see what that's about. In verse number 13, he says, but, and here's the opposite of what's going on in the first, first 12 verses, we are bound to give thanks all the way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and believe of the truth. Now, that verse is used, that's the only verse in the Bible actually, that can be used to say that people are elected to salvation before the world began. But that salvation, that verse is people being elected to justification in the body of Christ. When he says, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation, look at the next verse. Whereunto he hath called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, if he called them to salvation by Paul's gospel, was Paul's gospel always preached? No. Was it always made known? No. So the, from the beginning, that's from the beginning of the time Paul's gospel is preached. Because God didn't call these people to salvation forever. This is the, the interruption program. Because God, from the beginning of the dispensation of grace, the beginning time Paul's gospel is preached, called you to salvation. But the salvation is not justification, the salvation is from the things he just talked to you about in the first 12 verses. It's to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because when you get, to, when, when, when we're taken out of the way, caught up, we call that the rapture. What happens? When Christ is our life shall appear, then shall we appear with him in glory. So verse 13 and 14 is talking about the when we're taken out of the way. So the, the timing of the delusion is not now, it's in the future. And that's not the future of, you know, well, maybe it'll be in 2050. or, or so. It's not in the dispensation of grace. It's, in, it's after the dispensation of grace, after the interruption is taken out, after the body of Christ is taken out, and the prophetic program begins again. The next thing in the prophetic program is this strong delusion, this and what he says it for you in verse 11, wherefore God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. The delusion is believing the lie. The lie program is believing the, the thing in, in Mark. He says it'll be so strong that if it weren't, that if he didn't shorten the days, and that's why there are only 1,260 days and 12, that's why there's only a seven, uh, uh, that, that uh, 40 a seven-year period. He shortens those days. Actually, it shortens them to three and a half years in the passage. Otherwise, if they, if they ran to their, their natural conclusion, everybody would be deceived. By it. It's that strong of a, of, of a delusion. It's that powerful, a lie program that, that would go. So when he talks about the, the strength of the delusion, is it would, it would encompass everybody if he didn't shorten the days. So he does shorten the days. And it's that a, it, a delusion is an effectual inward working of a lie, of error. They refuse, they do not want to believe the truth. 
Now, if you look with me at Romans chapter number 1. The lie, John chapter 8, verse 44, the Lord Jesus Christ talking to the religious leaders of, of the nation Israel who were cap, taken captive by Satan. He says to them in John eight forty four, Ye are of your father the devil. The lust of your fathers ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there was no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. The lie program was, 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 was the, the uh, invention, the product of, of Satan and his, well, he, he did it in Genesis 3. First question he asked Eve, yea, hath God said? And then she misquotes the scripture, talks to him. He says, no, you won't die. Just flat out, deny, he flat out lies to her. And that lie program, Romans chapter 1 Verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. The lie is worshiping the creature more than the creator. The lie is the deification of the creature, making the creature God, not God, God, not submitting yourself to it. So the lie is that you can be your own God. There's an interesting thing in Revelation 21 verse 8 when it talks about putting people in the lake of fire. There he says the fearful and unbelieving and bomb hormonists and sorcerers and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire that burns with the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. It's where the lie leads you. So this strong delusion has to do with believing the lie program that the, that, that, uh, the satanic policy of evil has developed and works out. It's, the, it's in 2 Thessalonians he calls it the working of Satan. Now, it's interesting, and, and by the way, Romans chapter 1, the context historically is uh, the Tower of Babel. In Genesis chapter 11, that lie program became the, the, uh, the official position of the nations, the Gentile nations. They wanted, they didn't want God, they didn't want Jehovah's their God, they have their own God, be their own thing. And it became, it was established among the nations as their official system of operating. And Baal worship has been the thing that's controlled the operation of the nations of the earth all through history. That's why in, in, in Isaiah 14, speaking about the Antichrist, he's, he, one of the things he says about him is he has weakened the nations. He's destroyed the structure that God put for nationalism. And he's done it with this propagation of the Baal worship. And the Antichrist is the ultimate personification of the lie program. It comes to fruition in him. So when he says in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, I'm going to go back there. Verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. With all power and signs and lying wonders with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth. So the strong delusion is the lie that people are given that don't want to believe the love of the truth and they have the working of Satan, that spiritual working effectually in their inner man to make that lie program work in them um, come back with me to Isaiah 44. There's a, there's a verse back here I was thinking about this afternoon. We're talking about a strong delusion. It's so strong that, that a natural man can't get himself loose from it. Isaiah 44, verse number, verse number 10. Talking about the psyche of, 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 of idolatry. Who have formed a god or molten a graven image that is profitable for nothing. It's got no profit at all to it. Now come down to verse 20. He feedeth on ashes. A deceived heart hath turned him aside that he cannot deliver his soul. 
nor say, is there, no, is there not a lie in my right hand? He's holding a lie in his hand and he's so deceived, he thinks it's the truth. And he cannot deliver his soul. He's so hell captive. It's such a powerful delusion that he can't get away from it. Now, if you go back to, Th to Thessalonians, and again, that delusion is, 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 is based in Baal worship. Come back with me to Revelation chapter number 13 just for a second. When it talks about the, the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, that's, that's the whole Antichrist program. Revelation 13, talking about the Antichrist, verse number 3, And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, that's Satan, which gave power to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? And who is able to make war with him? So when they worship the Antichrist, they're really worshiping the power behind him. Satan. Coming down to verse 11. And I beheld another beast, it's called the false prophet, coming out of the earth. And he had two horns like a, like a lion, and he spake as a dragon, and he ex, uh, exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doth Great wonders, doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Do you remember any prophet in the Bible that made fire come down from heaven? You remember Elijah up on Mount Carmel fighting the prophets of Baal? And he made fire. This guy's going to, Elijah is there in the first part of the seventh week. He's going to duplicate, imitate, seek to replace the prophets of God. And deceiveth them, verse 14, that dwell on the earth by the means of the miracles which he hath power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they shall make an image to the beast who was, had, had the wound by a sword and did live. And he hath power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that it, as many as uh, would not worship the image of the beast, should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead that, all, that, that no man might buy or sell, save he that hath the mark and the name of the beast or the number of the beast. Here's wisdom. Now you see the, you, you see the economic power, the social governmental power, the religious power. He, he's got to consolidate all that power and, and he gives it to the Antichrist. The strong delusion is the thing causing people to follow the Antichrist. It's the lie program. It's simply put, it's, it's making man your God, making yourself God. When you refuse to believe, you said, I'm not going to believe what he said, I'm going to believe what I say. Now, the fascinating thing, if you go back to Thessalonians, to me about it, one of the fascinating things, is verse 11, it says, For this cause God shall send them strong delusion. This isn't just Satan doing it. This is God allowing Satan to do it. He's withholding him now. He won't let him do it. He won't let him take it to his full now. But after he's finished forming the body of Christ, that purpose is accomplished now the Lord literally just turns him loose and lets him go. For this, and the reason for it is in verse number 10, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. When you don't receive the love of the truth, that's the cause. Now, God isn't tricking them. He says God shall send him. He's not, he's not tricking them into it. He's just letting Satan have his way. But when he does that, he's really just giving them what they want. Now, Romans one twenty eight is a verse that you, you have to remember in these things. Get Romans 1, 20, chapter 1 and 1 Kings chapter 22.
There's a thing back here in Kings. It's back in. It's it's all through the Old Testament that God, when when God superintends some of these things, that people get kind of. I don't know if it's confused or just aggravated. But Romans one twenty eight. Even as they didn't like to like, did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. It isn't that God tricks them into doing something that, that they wouldn't have done. It's because they didn't like to retain God in their knowledge. They wanted to worship and serve the creature more than the creator. The delusion of the lie that I can be my own God. Because of that, the Lord literally just says, okay. I'll give you what you want. See how that works out for you. And even as they did not like to retain God in the knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. I'm nine that says, I don't want God to be, I don't want God. I'll do it my way. And they get the things that are not convenient. They get all those things that the flesh produces. But they also get some things that, that Satan produces. Because that's his, verse 32, Romans 1, 32, knowing who, the, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. They're, I mean, you're so far gone that you don't just do it. You're not just a sadist. You're a masochist. You take pleasure in other people being tormented. That's the depths of sin. That's a, that, that's, when you get down to where sin gets its complete hold on you, that's where you are. And in 1 Kings chapter number 22, there's an interesting passage back here where Mike, uh, Micah is explaining how God is going to destroy Ahab. And he's going to send some lying prophets. And he, he, he takes you back in, in, behind the scenes uh, in, 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 into the, the uh, realm where God works. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 22, verse number 19. I'll read verse, verse 18. It's kind of a funny. The king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? <laughs> he didn't want to hear from him because he never says anything good about me. It's always bad. And so he says something bad about him. Jehoshaphat's a good guy. And he says, well, we need to hear from the Lord. So he, he, Ahab gives him the, you know, the, 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 uh, the bad news. And he said, verse 19, Hear then therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven, the angelic creation, standing by him on his right hand and on his left. Now, the host of heaven, that's just not the angelic host. That's a, that's a group of people, a group of angels that operate in the upper echelon of the government of the heavens. The angelic realm is divided in, into, into uh, layers uh, of rank and authority. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, he talks about thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. The, the angelic creation, just like the human creation, has, has a governmental structure to it. And there are angels in that, in that governmental structure who are a part of a, uh, they're the congregation that sits on the, uh, on the sides of the north, the, 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 the congregation uh, of the of the rulers, the ones who take who take uh, the the high levels of, of of government in the angelic world, and they meet with the Lord. In Job, when when those angels came to meet with the Lord, and Satan came with them, this is this is uh, preachers call a council meeting. I hate that word council. I, it's a congregation. They're called in Psalms, verse number nineteen. And he said, "Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord." Here, here's what's happening. He's telling Ahab. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? Now that's what's going to happen. God's already said that's, what, that's what's happening. Then he takes into all these angels in, in, this, in this assembly and he says, okay, that's what's going to Who's got an idea about how to do this? And he's going to take counsel with them. He, you know, I was talking about this morning about, about how, how you make decisions. 
uh, and how God's designed for us to make decisions. He's all the time teaching his, the, the angels are, are charged with the, the government of the heavens. And he's teaching them how to do that, just like he teaches us. And so he says, who, who, who's got an idea about how to do this? Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner and another on that manner. And there came also a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I'll persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, now he doesn't tell you what everybody else says, but here's the winning, here's the winning vote. Wherewith, he said, I will go forth and I will put a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he, the Lord said, thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets. And the Lord has spoken evil concerning thee. So what he's telling him is, is what I'm telling you, Ahab, is, is not just something that comes off the hand, the cuff of God, and he just says, well, he's going to do this because I want to do it. He said, look, the angelic creation have watched you. They've figured out what's going on, and they know, they know what you want. You want the lie. You don't want the truth. And they, they put that judgment on them. So when it says God shall send them, it isn't that God just is trying to trick them and so forth. This is the conclusion of the government of, the, uh, of God and, his, and, and the congregation that works with him. And he's sending those li that lying spirit because of the, of the observation, because of the, the knowledge that they have of what's going on. They're giving them what they want. Look with me over at Psalm 81. This is, this is something that goes through the scriptures. Uh, Psalm 81. Verse 11. But my people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would none of me. So I gave them up unto their own hearts, lust, and they walked in their own counsel. They wouldn't walk in my counsel. So I said, okay, you think you know what you want? You don't want to serve the creature? You want to be, you want to be the, the creator? See what it gets you. And it literally leaves them over... The Lord doesn't have to break a sweat to let you get in trouble. I mean, following your own will does that. Come with me to Psalm 109. Psalm 109, verse number 17. As he loved cursing, so let it come unto him. As he delighted not in blessing, so let it be far from him. If that's what you want, that's what you get. So when it says God shall send them the strong delusion that they might believe a lie, they, it's because they don't want the, the truth, they don't, want, they don't receive the love of the truth, so that strong delusion is going to come. And ultimately, it's not just Satan doing it, it's God allowing Satan to give them what their heart really wants. That's spiritual delusion. That's the ultimate. Now, if that issue about sending them strong delusion that they might believe a lie, that they... Go back and read that again now. I'm going to get it just right. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause God sent them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now that applies specifically to these people in the seventh week of Daniel, in the passage. That's the, the issue there. That's not talking about somebody today in the dispensation of grace that won't believe, therefore in the tribulation they can't believe. That's talking about the people in the tribulation. A person has to believe in order to, to gain salvation. Now, that's, that's, that's a truth in every age. You have to believe to be, to be saved. That's one of the things that 
there's a lot of stuff going around in, in recent months about universal, the, the universalism. Uh, it's called, some people call it the salvation of all, that everybody's going to be saved in the end. Now, universalism has a, has a great scope of people. There are people that are not, not Christians, that are not, not Bible believers, that, that are universalists, all the way over to people who are grace people who are universalists. So you've got a big scope in there. The people that are more like us, that understand the gospel and so forth, their idea is that eventually everyone will believe. Most of the time people think, well, you know, you've you got to believe in this life because you get in the next life. And, and there's, no, there's no indication in the Bible there's no verse in the Bible that says in the next life you're going to get a chance to believe. But their, 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 their feeling is that, you, that, that they do. And that's, that's, that's because you can't get saved if you don't believe. Romans chapter number 3, one of the explanations that, uh, first of all, you can't become a universalist unless you, unless you abandon the King James Bible. Because you've got to change the words in the King James Bible. Somebody says, well, I don't know. You have, to, if you have to abandon the King James Bible as your final authority. And you have to make your Greek lexicon your final authority. So you've abandoned the King James Bible. Right. Even if you still want to use it. But when it talks about the lake of fire, the idea there is fire is designed often in Scripture to purge things. And so the idea there is, is what was called the, the fire is a uh, purgation. The fire purges out people uh, and, and purge, burns out their sin and purges them. Romans chapter 3, verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the mission of sin. A propitiation is a Pay, is a satisfying payment. It's a, pur, it's a purgation. You're purging away sin. But how does it come? By faith in his blood. That's God has faith in the blood of Jesus Christ to purge you from your sin. That's God's faith. Verse 26, to declare I said at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of them which believe in Jesus, you can't get the benefit of the propitiation that's in the blood of Christ unless you believe. So to have the salvation of everyone, even lost people in this age, you have to believe. Now, 1 Timothy chapter number 4 is a real problem for that. Let's get two verses, 1 Timothy 4 and John chapter 3. First Timothy 4, verse number 10. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men. Now that's where the phrase salvation of all comes from. Especially those that believe. Now that's two categories of people. There's, he's the Savior of all men, and he's especially the Savior of those that believe. That means the all men didn't believe. These people did. Those people haven't. And by that verse you can write down Romans 3.22. It's the righteousness of God which is unto all and upon all them that believe. It's available for everyone. It's applied to those that believe. So if you don't believe, it doesn't get applied to you. So the idea is that, well, somewhere along in life, in the afterlife... People are going to spend enough time in the lake of fire that they've realized it's not a good thing not to believe, and they'll believe. Luke chapter number 16, there's a, the, the rich man's brother's in hell, and he never, he's in hell. He's suffering the torments of hell, whatever that is, whatever you want to make it be, and yet he doesn't believe. He argues, and instead of believing, he doesn't. Well, you say, well, he hadn't been there long enough. <laughs> well, how long do you have to be there? You know, you, I don't know. You, they, they have to explain that. I can't explain it. The thing, the thing that, for me, undercuts all of that is the only thing that satisfies the justice of God is the blood of Jesus Christ. 
And the only way the Bible gives you a con ability to contact the blood of Jesus Christ is by faith. Now you have to decide. He's the salvation of all men, especially those that believe. How do the all men become one of those that believe if you've got the two categories? John 3, verse 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not, shall, shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. If you don't believe, what do you get? The wrath of God. So the issue is believing to get contact. So you have to, you, have, you better get a verse that says after you die and after you go to hell on the lake of fire, that then you believe. Because if you don't believe, he's the salvation of all, but especially the guy that believes. There's no time limit on that issue. So the problem about not believing a person has got to believe to be saved. So that's what, and that's what Thessalonians is doing there. They don't want to believe. They refuse to believe. They're not going to believe. And their unbelief doesn't, con doesn't convince them to become believers. But it puts them in the position of, of having the deception and the damnation. That they all might be damned who believe not the love of the truth. The issue is you didn't believe the love of the truth. Now... I'm going to go back to the people that asked me the question. If righteousness exalts a nation and sin is a reproach to any people, what should be your focus? What should be our focus? If righteousness exalts a nation, what makes people righteous? The gospel. If righteousness exalts a nation, what we need to be about is out telling people the gospel so they can get saved and become the righteousness of God. You can't make yourself righteous. You can do righteous things. You can philosophize yourself into it. You can talk yourself into it. You can social, but you can't make yourself. God has to make you righteous. So our focus needs to be telling people the gospel so that they can get saved, they can become righteous, be made the righteous of God in Christ, and then telling the body of Christ who they are and what the future holds. I mean, Christ, we set our, things on, our affection on things above because when Christ, who is our righteousness, our life shall appear, will appear with it. You've got a future. God's going to do something with you. It isn't just right now. So who are you in Christ? You're the righteousness of God in Him. I said this morning, you don't have to spend your time trying to make God love you. He already does. You don't have to spend your time trying to get God to accept you. He already does. So our focus needs to be on telling people the gospel and then telling saved people the truth about who they are in Christ. So if we focus on how, how can I live my life so that my life glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, when you say that, I was thinking about this the other day. What do you mean when you say, I want my life to glorify the, the glory of God? We're reading, we're studying Ezekiel. And the glory of God appears. If you, if you just want one word, it's the word evidence. The, the glory of God is the evidence of God's presence in that temple. When God's glorified in you, there's the evidence that Jesus Christ is your life. So you live your life so that it's evident that Christ is your life. And you, you live your life so that you can influence others to believe the gospel that you're telling them. That it's valuable. That it makes a difference. And that's important. Then it's not a strong delusion, but it's the word of God that works effectually in you that believe. It's the truth working effectually in us as opposed to the lie working effectually in them. And listen, when you put the truth up against the lie, you know which one wins? Which one has the power of God in it? The truth. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes. Okay? So, what is the strong delusion? It's the lie program of the adversary that leads to the Antichrist. The more important question is, what's the truth program? And that's the truth of the church, the body of Christ. That's, that's, 
God would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Amen. That's who we are, what we're about. Okay? So the politics and so forth is not where the answer is. The answer is telling them the gospel. And I know that that's, that, that's sort of discounted. You say, well, you know, you just tell me. No. That's where the answer is. Because righteousness exalts a nation. That's, the, that's the, the word of God's commentary on how to build a strong nation. But you can't have righteousness without the gospel. And when people get saved, that's how you start that. So when we're out there telling the gospel people, and you're out there telling the gospel people, you're doing the one single thing that is the foundation of building a strong nation. Okay? All right. So don't worry about the commentators. Get in your book and have Christ live in you. All right. Father, we thank you tonight for your love and your grace and the opportunity you give us to be, be vessels, be the body of Christ, be the temple where you choose to live your life, demonstrate, put, put on display the evidence of what it is to have you as life. We thank you for that in Christ's name. Amen. All right.